to it in just a moment. There's a painting in my office. There's quite a few paintings in my office. I love art. But there's one particular painting in my office that I paid a lot of money for. And the image is of a Latino immigrant family crossing the Sonoran Desert at night. The image has a father, a mother, and a baby boy. And the father leads the family with an exhausted but stoic look. His eyes are fixed in the distance as if he is looking at something. Possibly the destination. It's unclear. The mother follows closely behind him with a worried look on her face. Her eyebrows are slightly lifted. Her eyes are glossy as if she has been crying. And her eyes also look towards a distance, but in a different direction. And the baby is wrapped in a purple sheet, a royal color, and it's slung over the mother's shoulder. And around the baby's head is a halo with the Greek letters Omicron, Omega, and Nu, which historically Christians have always used to identify Jesus. This image speaks to me at a visceral level. Because in the painting, I see my immigrant family. In the painting, I also see myself. But within that image, I also see Jesus. In one powerful image, I see how the story of my people and of my family is also the story of Christ. A hated refugee, an immigrant, rising above to love those who seek to harm him. I see this painting every day. And periodically, I meditate on the image. But last year, on a cold December morning, the image spoke to me differently. And this time, the image reminded me of something else. This time, what I saw in the image was the fragility of life. The fragility of pregnancy, of childbirth, of infancy and childhood. It's fascinating how the season in our lives opens our eyes to see things, to see the world, to see people, to see God in different ways. You know what I'm saying? Because at the time, my wife was pregnant and nobody knew that we were expecting It was our joyful secret amidst the chaos that was our house as we renovated. We were halfway through the pregnancy. And every time we went to the doctor, we held our breaths. Any parents here know what I'm talking about? Every time you go to the doctor, you're like, I really hope it's only good news. (laughs) We felt this excitement mixed with dread. Excitement to hear news on our child and to see the sonogram. But there was also a dread inside of us because my wife and I, we both have a lot of health problems. And my wife at some point in her younger years was anemic, needed B12 supplements. She was told she couldn't have kids. So we're worried. We're worried, is this baby going to be okay? And if it is okay, is this baby going to suffer from something that we're going to have to wrestle with for the rest of our lives? Questions would rush through our heads like, is the baby healthy? Is he still alive? Does he have any defects? Is the heart rate normal? Is everything as it should be? 
Is there anything that we should keep our eye on that could potentially threaten the life of this child? And for anyone who has gone through this process, you know how it goes. The sonographer comes into the room, and you're asking a hundred questions, and they don't answer any of them. Which makes you worry. And then they leave the room, and I, I assume the doctor is looking at these pictures for what feels like eight hours. And then finally the doctor comes in, and you're wondering to yourself, did that take a long time because there's something wrong? And then at long last, the doctor says, you have a great looking baby. And you take this sigh of relief. But although I was relieved, and my wife as well, I knew that the future could be unpredictable. I've lived long enough to know that things can quickly change. It was beautiful and exciting, but the fragility, the weakness, how, how sensitive the whole thing was, it filled me with dread. Why can't something like this just be sure? Why does it have to be so fragile? And suddenly, I saw the incarnation of Jesus in a way that I had never seen it before. It's interesting how where we are in our lives, the experiences that we have, completely change how we see things. I saw the fragileness of it all. I saw vulnerability. I saw weakness. And you see, my friends, the reason this stood out to me so much is because every morning, every morning, without fail, I wake up early. I go into my office. I get on my knees and I pray. And in the presence of the Almighty, my mind is filled with the wonder of God. I am overwhelmed by his holiness, by his majesty, by his glory and power. Day after day, I am left speechless by the immensity of our ineffable God. But on that morning, God revealed to me a different side of him. One that, if I'm honest, I don't really like. <laughs> he showed me the nature that he took on to save me. He showed me fragility. He showed me vulnerability, weakness. From mighty, ineffable, glory and majesty to a weak child that can't even hold his own head. But why? Why would God do this? Why would God condescend to such a low level? Isn't there another way? Oh, this is the question that we've asked ourselves hundreds of times, possibly. Wasn't there another way? And the answer is no, there wasn't. And I wouldn't want it any other way. We shouldn't want it any other way. Because it is a necessary condescension for mercy. I want us to read Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10 together. Hebrews chapter 2. Says, For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist, 
in bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. That last line, that Christ needed to be made perfect through suffering. What does that mean? What does it mean that Christ needed to be made perfect for suf through suffering? It's actually quite simple. It means that in heaven, in heaven, Jesus was perfect as God. In his incarnation, in becoming a man, he was perfect as a man. But by his suffering, he became perfect as Savior. Because only a compassionate Savior who knows what it feels like to suffer as we suffer. Only a Savior that knows what it's like to be tempted as we are tempted. Only a Savior that knows what it feels like to be cold, to be hungry, to be sad, to mourn. Only a Savior that has walked the same painful path that we have walked is worthy of saving us. Christ was made perfect through his suffering because his suffering made him perfect as Savior. This is the testimony of Christmas, that God is with us as one of us. And as one of us, his mercy sympathizes powerfully with our weakness because he knows he knows what it's like to be weak. Not just theoretically, he knows it. As it is written, and I invite you to read Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 with me. Hebrews 4, verse 15. The scripture reads, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Amen? For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We're often so worried about disappointing God as if God didn't know what he was already getting when he chose to love us. Way before the birth of Christ, the psalmist praised God in Psalm 103, verse 14, by stating that God is merciful to us because he remembers that we are but dust. What does that mean? God remembers. He knows. He knows what we're made of. He knows we're nothing but dust. He knows that we're weak. He knows our capabilities. He knows what our limitations are. So he's merciful to us because he understands. But in Christ, God does more than remember our nature. He does more than understand. In Christ, he does more than sympathize with our weakness. But in Christ, he shares in it. And thus, because he shares in our weakness, he is perfect. He is perfect because I know his mercy comes from a place of understanding. In the words of the angel in Revelation chapter 5, verse 2, he is worthy of giving us mercy. Mercy not to abandon us. Praise be to God. Mercy to love us. Praise be to God. As John Flavel states, 
As God did not first choose you because you were high, he will not now forsake you because you are low. He came in weakness that the weak might recognize him. And he reigns in strength that those who are weak may find hope in him. In Christ, we can confidently know that despite the hardships of life and despite our daily failures, despite the struggles, God is still with us. Christ is our Emmanuel, our constant presence and mercy. All glory, honor, and majesty to the King of kings who shared in our weakness that he might give us mercy. Come, Emmanuel. Amen.